There are in general two types of codecs in the world. There is a lossless codex, where we lose nothing. Think about it as a zip file where you compress documents and text, and when you uncompress it, everything is there bit by bit. And then there are lossy codecs. In lossy codecs, what we compress is not necessarily exactly what we're going to get when we uncompress that. Why do we need that? With lossy compression, we can throw a lot more and compress a lot more aggressively. And since what we're trying to do is to send media, there are things that we can actually throw away. For example, we can throw away things that are not perceived by the human eye or the human ear. Okay, once we throw these away, we can compress everything else. Okay, and the purpose of lossy codex is to do that. What we also want in WebRTC and in Voice over IP is to do that in RTC, in real time for real time communications, where the focus is going to be low latency in the encoding and decoding. We don't want the compression and decompression processes in the codec to take too long, because if they take too long, this is not going to be real time anymore. We're looking for interactivity. In a media subsystem, we're going to have the camera or the microphone. The data from there as a raw format is going to go into the encoder. The encoder is going to compress that data. Then we're going to send that over the network. On the other side, we're going to receive that data over the network, decode it on the other side and play it back. There are general codec characteristics that are out there for codecs. They start by complexity, the, num the amount of CPU I need in order to compress and decompress the data of that codec. The more modern the codec, the more CPU it takes because it is more complex. The complexity comes from the number of tools that are available inside the codec in order to compress. Then there's latency how much milliseconds it's going to take the codec to encode or decode the frames that it needs to send and receive. The lower the latency, the more complicated uh, the codec can be in terms of its implementation and the less tools it can use because it doesn't have time to use them. There's resiliency. We are sending the codec over the network. Some packets might be lost. And then the question is, how does the codec deal with packet losses? What do you do when packets are not received without needing to retransmit these packets? Okay, again, we're in low latency. There is no time for retransmissions usually. Different codecs have different characteristics when it comes to resiliency and what they do with packet losses. Then there's IPR, royalty payments. A lot of the codecs today require paying for the patents that are used for them. If you want to use a codec, you might need to pay someone for using it. And there's popularity. How much popular a codec is, what's the ecosystem around it, who is using it. The more popular the codec, the easier it is going to be for you to use it and to find developers and people that know how to use this codec that can help you with it. Then there's support, both software and hardware. This is related to the ecosystem and popularity because codecs that have hardware support are going to be easier to use and they're not going to take the CPU out of your machine. They're going to take it from the hardware instead. There are also software implementations and they're not the same. They're not comparable to one another. Some are better than others for different use cases and scenarios. Now, a very important thing is that the codec is usually defined by the decoder, not by the encoder. Okay? A codec is simply a set of rules that simply states what you need to do when you see a certain kind of bitrate, how to unravel that bitrate and how to decode it. This in turn is going to dictate a set of tools that are available for the encoder. So now the encoder is a bag of different tools and then the encoder needs to decide which tool to use when. And the encoder's complexity and efficiency is going to depend on the implementer, the one that have written that encoder, because different encoders of the same codec can produce different results. Some might take more CPU, be more resilient, less resilient, low latency or high latency for the time they take to work. All depends on the implementer. 
in WebRTC we have different media codecs. The mandatory to implement are G711 and Opus. For the audio codecs, G711 is narrowband, selected because it is PSTN and voice over IP interlocking, and Opus is a very flexible audio codec that provides anywhere between narrow wideband, uh, narrow sub to wideband support um, of audio. We've got DTMF as a kind of a codec, as well as VP8 and H.264, two video codecs that are supported in WebRTC. VP8 is Google's open source codec, whereas H.264 comes with mpeg LA licensing and requires IPR. It requires paying patents for using it. In the browsers today, we've got more codecs available than the ones that are mandatory to implement. VP8, H.264 and VP9 are all available ac across all browsers. HEVC might be available on Safari, but not for WebRTC today at least. AV1 is available on Chrome, not really available on Edge, but should be because Edge and Chrome are the same browser and it's not yet available on Firefox and Safari. You can check out more terms in webrtcglossary.com or go to check my training courses on webrtccourse.com. Thank you.